The reason I focus almost 99% of my public commentary on economics is because you asked an important question at the top, how do we fix this? Yeah. Well, what did I say about the stimulus checks? Stimulus checks have 80% approval rating. So that's the type of thing, if I was Joe Biden and I wanted to actually heal this country, that's the very first thing I would have done when I came into office. Same thing on uh, when you look at anything that's going to increase wages. Um, I, I said on the show, I was like, look, I think Joe Biden will have an 80% approval rating if he does two things. If he gives every American a $2,000 stimulus check and gives everybody who wants a vaccine a vaccine. That's it. It's pretty simple. Because here's the thing. I don't really like Greg Abbott that much. We have like very different politics. I'm from Texas, but my parents got vaccinated really quickly. That means something to me. I'm like, listen, I don't really care about a lot of the other stuff. He got my family vaccinated like that. Well, I will forever remember that. And that's how we will remember the checks. This is a part of the reason why Trump almost won the election and why if the Republicans had been smart enough to give him a 2000, another round of checks, 100% would have won, which is that people were like, look, I don't really like Trump, but I got a check with his name on it. And that meant something to me and my family. I'm not saying for all the libertarians out there that you should go and like endlessly spend money and buy votes. Mm -hmm. What I am saying is lean into the majoritarian positions without adding your culture war bullshit on top of it. Yeah. So for example, What's the number one concern that AOC says after the first round of checks got out? Oh, the checks didn't go to Ill illegal immigrants. I'm like, are you out of your fucking mind? Like, this is the most popular policy America has probably done in 50 years, you know, since like Medicare. And you're you go inserting ruin it. You're what? ruining it. Yeah. And then on the right is the same thing, which is that they'll be like, these checks are going to like, you know, low level, blah, blah, you know, people who are lazy and don't work. I'm like, oh, there you go. You know, like you're just playing a caricature mm -hmm. of what you are. Like if you lean into those issues and you got to do it clean, this is the, this is what everybody hates about D.C., which is that Biden right now is doing the fourteen hundred dollar checks but he's looping it in with his COVID relief bill and all that. That's his prerogative. That's the Democrats' prerogative. They won the election. That's fine. But I'll tell you what I would have done if I was him. I would have come in and I would have said there's five United States senators who are on the record, Republicans, who say they'll vote for a $2,000 check. And I would put that on the floor of the United States Senate on my you know first or so, the first day possible. Mm -hmm. And I would have passed it and I would have forced those Republican senators to live up to that vote for this bill, mm -hmm. come to the Oval Office for a signing so that the very first thing of my presidency was to say, I'm giving you all this relief check. This night long national nightmare is over. Take this money. Do with it what you need. We've all suffered together. The thing about Biden is he has a portrait of FDR in, his, in the Oval, which kind of bothers me because he thinks of himself as an FDR-like figure. Mm -hmm. But this is, you have to understand the majesty of FDR. We're talking about a person who passed a piece of legislation five days after he became president, and he passed 15 transformative pieces of legislation in the first 100 days. We're on day like 34, 35, and nothing has passed. The reconciliation bill will eventually become law, but it'll become law with no Republican votes. And again, that's fine, If but it's not fulfilling that legacy and the urgency of the action. And the mandate, which I believe that history has handed, it handed it to Trump and he fucked it up, right? He totally screwed it up. He could have remade America and made us into the greatest country ever coming out on the other side of this. He decided not to do that. I think Biden was again handed that like a scepter almost. It's like all you have to do, all America wants is for you to raise it up high, yeah. but he's keeping it within the realm of traditional politics. I think it's a huge mistake. Why? So this is, everything yeah. you're saying is Perfect sense. Like take, yeah. Okay. It's like, it, it's like again. If the aliens showed up, it's yeah. like the obvious <laughs> thing to do is like, yeah. what's the popular thing? Like eighty percent of Americans support this. Like do that clean. Uh, also do it like with like grace, where you're able to bring people together, not like in a political way, but yeah. like obvious, like obvious common sense way. Like uh, just people, the Republicans and Democrats just bring them together on a policy and like bold, just hammer it mm -hmm. without the dirt, without the mess, whatever, try to compromise. Just the yell with, have a good Twitter account, like loud, 
very clear. We're going to give a $2,000 stimulus check. Anyone who wants a vaccine gets a vaccine at scale. What make America, let's make America great again yeah. by manufacturing. Like we are manufacturing most of the world's vaccine because we're bad motherfuckers. Yeah. And, and well, without maybe uh, with, with more eloquence than that and, and just do that. Why haven't we seen that for many, for several presidencies? Because of coalitional politics and they owe something to somebody else. For example, Biden has got a lot of the Democratic constituency he has to satisfy within this bill. So there's going to be a lot of shit that goes in there, state and local aid, um, all this stuff. Again, I'm not even saying this is bad, but he's like, his theory is, and this isn't wrong, is like, we're going to take the really popular stuff and use it as cover for the more downwardly less popular. And so the Dems could face the accusation. The people who are on this side, this is their pushback to me. They're like, why would we give away the most popular thing in the bill? And then we would never be able to pass state and local aid, yeah. right? Why would we do that? And the Republicans do the same thing, right? Like Mitch McConnell, because he's a fucking idiot, decided to say, we're going to pair these $2,000 stimulus checks with like Section 230 repeal. And it was like, oh, it's obviously dead, right? Like it's not going to happen together. That's largely why I believe Trump lost the election and why those races down in Georgia went the way that they did. Obviously, Trump had something to do with it. But the reason why is they have longstanding things that they've wanted to get done. And in the words of Rahm Emanuel, never let a good crisis go to waste and try and get as much as you possibly can done within a single bill. My counter would be this. Things have worked this way for too long, which is that the reconciliation bill is almost certainly going to be the only large signature le uh, legislative accomplishment of the Biden presidency. That's just how American politics works. Maybe he gets one more. Maybe one. Hmm. He gets a second reconciliation bill. Then you're running for the midterms. It's over. I believe that by trying to change the paradigm of our politics, leaning into exactly what I'm talking here, you could possibly transcend that to a new one. And I'm not naive. I think people respond to political pressures. And the way that we found this out was David Perdue, who is just a total corporate, you know, dollar drawer, dollar general CEO guy. He was against the original $1,200 stimulus checks. But then Trump came out, who's the single most popular figure in the Republican Party. He's like, I want $2,000 stimulus checks. And all of a sudden, Purdue running in Georgia is like, yeah, I'm with President Trump. I want a $2,000 stimulus check. That was, if you're an astute observer of politics, to say, you can see there that you can force people to do the right thing yeah. because it's the popular thing. And that if it's clean, if you don't give them any other excuse, they have to do it. Yeah. So this is this is what we've been gaslit into our culture war framework of politics. And the reason it feels so broken and awful is because it is. But there is a way out. It's just that nobody wants to be. It's a game of chicken, right? Because maybe it is true. Maybe we would never be able to get your other Democratic priorities or your Republican priorities. But I think that the country understands that this is fucking terrible <laughs> and would be willing to support somebody who does it differently. There's just a lot of disincentives to not stay without, stay, there's a lot of incentives to not stray from the traditional path. Yeah, is it also possible that the A students are not participating? <laughs> like we drove all of the the superstars away from politics. Mm -hmm. So like you just had this argument before. I mean, everything you're saying sort of uh, rings true. Like this is the obvious thing to do. As a student of history, you can almost like tell, like if you look at great people in history, this is what great leaders in history, this is what they did. It's like uh, clean, bold action. And sometimes facing crisis, but we're facing a crisis. No, right we're now. in a crisis. We've exactly. been, <laughs> exactly. <Yeah. laughs> so why don't we, uh, uh, why don't we see those leaders step up? That's, I mean, you say that's kind of like, it, it makes sense. There's a lot of different interests to play. Mm -hmm. You don't want to risk too many things, so on and so forth. But that's what like, that sounds like the C students. <laughs> I don't think it's that. I think it's that the pipeline of politician creation is just totally broken from beginning that's to it. end. So it's not that A students don't want to be uh, politicians. 
it's basically the way that our current primary system is constructed is what is the greatest threat to you as a member of Congress? It's not losing your reelection. It's losing your primary, right? So that means, especially in a safe district, you're most concerned about being hit if you're a Republican from the right and if you're a Democrat from the left for not being a good enough one. Mm -hmm. That's actually what stops people, more heterodox people in particular, from winning primaries because the people who vote in our primaries are the party faithful. That's how you get the production. The production, it's important to understand the production pipeline, yeah. which is that. All right, I'm from Texas, so that's what I know best. So it's like, if you think in Texas, if you're a more heterodox like state legislature or something who's re works with the left on this and does that, you're gonna get your ass beat in a Republican primary because they're gonna be like, he worked with the left to do this, blah, blah, take it out of context and you're screwed. Mm -hmm. And then that means you never ascend up the next level of the ladder and then so on and so forth all the way. But I do think Trump changed everything. This is why I have some hope, which is that he showed me that all the people I listened to were totally wrong about mm -hmm. politics. And that's the most valuable lesson you could ever teach yeah. me, which was, I was like, wait, I don't have to listen to these people. I'm like, they don't know anything, actually. <laughs> you, you know? Yeah, that's, I mean, that's powerful, man. Yeah. I'm like, he did it. That's exceptionally powerful. This guy. Even if yeah. he didn't do anything with it. It doesn't matter. Right. He showed that it's possible. Exactly. And that. That means uh, that means a lot. That mean you, you're absolutely right. There's yeah. young people right now that kind of look, turn around, and like, huh? You're like, wait, I don't have to comb my hair a certain way, yeah. and go to law school yeah. and be an asshole who everybody knows is an asshole, yeah. and and then get elected to state legislature. I mean, look, who's the number one person in the New York prime or New York City uh, primary right now? Andrew Yang. He's polling higher than everybody else in the race. I, look, maybe the polls are totally fucked and maybe he'll lose because of ranked choice voting and all that. But I consider Andrew, I mean, I know him a little bit and I've you know, followed his candidacy from the very beginning. I consider him an inspiration. He's the new generation of politics. Like if I see who's going to be president 20 years from now, it's going to be, I'm not saying it's going to be Andrew Yang. I think it's going to be somebody like Andrew Yang outside the political system who talks in a totally different way, right? Just a completely... One of my favorite things that he said on the debate stage, he's like, look at us, we're all wearing makeup. It's crazy, you know? Yeah, <laughs> like, yeah. And it, he like he like brought that, that he brought that, and he's writing like, yeah, why are, they're all wearing makeup. He probably like, arguably hasn't gone far enough almost. Yes. Because, uh, but he showed that it's possible. And then you you see other, like AOC is a good example of somebody, okay. at least in my opinion, is doing the same kind of thing, but going too far. In, in like, well, I don't know. She's doing the Trump thing, but on the other side. So I don't know. I, it's, what's too far? Don't Who knows? take a normative judgment of it. Yeah. I will tell you the future of politics Just looks appreciate like Appreciate the art of it. <laughs> right? No, I do. Look, I don't, I'm not a big AOC fan, but she's a genius. Media genius. Once in a generation talent. The way that she uses social media, Instagram, and everybody on the right is like trying to copy her. Like Matt Gates, like I want to be the conservative AOC. I'm like, it's just not going to happen, dude. Like it, it, you just don't have it. Like what she has, it's like, it's electric. And Trump had that. Like I've been to a Trump rally, like to cover as a journalist, there's nothing like it in, in America. Well, and Yang, Yang is similar. It's the same way where you're like, there is something going on here, which is just like, I've been to an Obama rally. I've been to a Clinton rally. I've been to um, several normal pol. That's eh, fine, you know. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. With Trump and with Yang, it was it's another world. Yeah, it's another yeah. world. Yang, Yang. Yeah. There's there's, a, there's probably thousands of people listening right now who are just like doing a <laughs> yeah. slow clap. Yes, I know, I know. Uh, Yang, Yang, yeah. uh, forever. Okay, but uh, yeah, I'm, I mean, my worst fear. I I prefer Yang, uh, uh, Andrew Yang, kind of free uh improvisational idea exchange all that versus AOC who I think no matter what she stands for is a, a drama machine creates dramas just like Trump does I would say my worst fear would be in 2024 is AOC old enough it'd be AOC versus Trump I don't think she's old enough I think you'd have to be I don't know I think she's 30 so she needs five more years so probably not yeah. Okay. But that kind of, yeah. that that's, or Trump Jr. Well, AOC probably wouldn't win a Democratic primary. So, I mean, look, Joe Biden is, you know, so they that's pretty what, much showed that. Th yeah. That's exactly what you're saying. Is yeah. This process grooms you over time. It's You see the same thing in academia, actually, which is very interesting. 
is the the process of getting tenure. There's this, it's like you're being taught without explicitly being taught yes. to behave in the way that everybody's behaved before. I've heard this, it was funny, I've had a few conversations that um, were deeply disappointing, which, <laughs> which, are, which involved statements like, this is what's good for your career. Yes. This kind of conversation, almost like mentor to mentee conversation, where it's, you know, it's like, there's a grooming process in the same way, I guess you're saying the primary process mm -hmm. does the same kind of thing. So, I mean, that's what people have talked about with Andrew Yang. It was, uh, it was he was being suppressed by a bunch of different forces, the mainstream media and all. Just the democratic, just that whole process didn't, didn't like, the the honesty that he was showing, right? For now, but here's my question to you: People got to see. Look, Jordan Peterson is one of the most famous people in America, right? Like you have a massive podcast. You're more famous than half the ninety nine percent of the people at MIT. Mm -hmm. So, like from that perspective, everything has changed. And somewhere out there, there is a student who's taking notice. Yeah. And I've noticed that with my own career, everybody thought I was crazy for doing this show with Crystal, The Hill. They thought it was nuts. They're like, what are you doing? You're a White House correspondent. You've got a job forever. The other job offer I had was being a White House correspondent. And people thought I was nuts for not just sticking there and you know aging out within Washington, pining for uh, appearances on Fox News and CNN and MSNBC. But I hated it. I just hated doing it. And I did not want to be a company man, like a Washington man, who's one of those guys who like brags to his friends about how many times he's been on Fox or whatever, mostly because I just have a rebellious streak and I hate being at the subject of other people. I created something new, which a lot of people watch to get their news. And I notice that younger people who are almost all my audience, they don't really look up to any of the people yeah. in traditional, right? They don't. They don't go and are, they're not coming up and being like, how do I be like Jim Acosta? You know, they're like, how, they're like, hey, how did you do what you do? And the way you did it is by bucking the system. Yeah. So I think that we are at a total split point. And look, there will always be a path for people. Cause like, I don't want people to overlearn this lesson. I have people who are like, I'm not going to go to college. And I'm like, well, just wait. <laughs> yeah. Like, I'm like, just <laughs> I'm starting a podcast. Yeah, yeah. Like, stop. Man. Just like, yeah. just wait, hold on a second. But, there will always be a path for the institutional. There will, that will always be there for you. But now there's something else. Now there's another game in town. And that's more appealing to millions and millions and millions and millions of people who feel unserved by the corporate media, CNN, and these people, possibly who feel unserved um, in the, you know, the faculty. Like yeah. if you are an up and comer who wants to teach as many young people as possible, I think you should be on YouTube. Right, like, look at the Khan Academy guy. That guy created a huge business. So I just think we can be cynical and like upset about what that system is, but we should also have hope. Like, I have a lot of hope for what can be in the future. Yeah, there's a there's a guy people should check out. So my, my story is a little bit different because I basically uh, stepped aside for, yeah, for, with the dream of being an entrepreneur earlier in the pipeline than like a like a legitimate like senior faculty would. There's an example somebody people should check out, Andrew Huberman from Stanford, who's a neuroscientist, who's as world class as it gets in terms of like tenure faculty, just a really world class researcher. And now he's doing YouTube. And yeah, do, I see him on Instagram. Yeah. And he's right. great. So he switched. So he not just yeah. does Instagram, he now has a podcast mm -hmm. and he's doing he's changing the nature of like I believe that Andrew might be the future of Stanford. And for a lot, it's funny, like he's basically, Joe Rogan is an inspiration to Andrew mm -hmm. and, and to me as well. And so those ripple effects and Andrew is an inspiration probably just like you're saying to these young, like 25 year olds who are soon to become faculty if we're just talking about academia. And the same is probably happening with, with government is funny enough, Trump, probably is inspiring a huge number of people who are saying, wait a minute, I don't have to play by the rules. Exactly. And uh, I have to, I can think outside the box here and you're right. And the institutions we're seeing are just probably lagging behind. So the optimistic view is the future <laughs> uh, is going to be full of exciting new ideas. So Andrew Young is just kind of the beginning of this He's whole He's tip thing. of the iceberg. Yeah. And, I, and I hope that iceberg doesn't, it's not this influencer. One of the things that really, <laughs> 
bothers me. Yeah. I've gotten a chance. No, I should be careful here. I don't want to. I, I love everybody. But, it, you know, these people who talk about, like, you know, how to make your first million or how to succeed. And and they're so, I mean, yeah, that, that makes me a little bit cynical about, uh, I'm worried that the people that win the game of politics will be ones that want to win the game of politics. <laughs> they already As, are, man. Yeah. And, and like we mentioned AOC, mm -hmm. it's, I hope they optimize for the 80% populist thing, <laughs> right? Like they optimize for that badass thing that history will remember you as the great man or woman that did this thing versus how do I maximize engagement today and keep growing those numbers? The, the influencers are so, I'm so allergic to this, man. Mm -hmm. They keep saying how many followers they have on the different accounts. And it's like, I, I, I don't think they understand. Maybe I don't understand. I don't really care. I think it has destructive psychological effects one like thinking about the number like getting excited your number went from 100 to 101 and being like and today went out to 105 whoa that's a big jump that maybe like thinking in this way like i wonder what i did i'll do that again in this way one it's uh it creates anxiety and those psychological effects whatever the the more important thing is it prevents you from truly thinking boldly in the long arc of history in uh, creatively yes. thinking outside the box doing huge actions 100%. and i actually op my optimism is in the sense that that kind of action will beat out all the influencers well i don't know lex <laughs> this is where my cynicism comes in so there's a guy madison cawthorn the youngest member of congress um and he i, I don't want to say got caught but there was like an email where he was like my staff is only oriented around comms. Like he was basically saying, he got basically caught oh, saying no. like, my staff is only uh, centered on communications. And that's the right play. If you do want to get the benefits of our current electoral, political, and engagement system, which is that, what's the best way to be known within the right as a, as a right-wing politician? It's to be a culture warrior, go on Ben Shapiro's podcast, be one of the people on Fox News, go on Sean Hannity's show, go on Tucker's show, and all of that, because you become a mini celebrity within that world. Left unsaid is that that world is increasingly shrinking portion of the American population, and they barely, they can't even win a popular vote election, um, let alone barely win and eke out an electoral college victory in 2016. Well, but the incentives are all aligned within that. And it's the same thing really on the left. But you're right, which is that ultimate, and look, th this, is, this is why geniuses are geniuses because they buck the short-term incentives. They focus on the long-term. They bet big and they usually fail. But then when they get big, they, they uh, succeed spectacularly. Yeah. The people I know who have done this the best are like a lot of the crypto folks that I've spoken to. Like- some of the stuff they say, I'm like, I don't know if that's going to happen. But look, they're like billionaires, right? Yeah. You know? so, <laughs> yeah. And you're like, so they were wrong. So it's it, uh, the way I've heard it expressed is you can be wrong a lot, but when you're right, you get right big. Yeah. And I mean, I've seen this in Elon Musk's career. I mean, he took spectacular risk, like spectacular risk and just double down, double down, double down, double down, double down. And you can kind of tell to him. I mean, you know him better than I do, but like from my observation, I don't think the money matters no. as, right? I just, I, like when I see him, I'm like, I don't, it's, nobody works as hard as you do and builds the way that you build if it's just about the money. It's just, it just doesn't happen. Like nobody wills SpaceX into existence just for the money. Like it's not worth it, frankly, right? Like he probably destroyed years of his life and like mental sanity. Money or attention or fame, none of that. Yeah. That's, that's not the primary priority. Well, that's what's so appealing to me, to me in particular about him, just like and how he built. Like I read a biography of him and just like the way that he constructed his life and like is able to hyper focus in meeting after meeting and drill down and also hire all of the right people who execute each one of his tasks discreetly to his perfection is amazing. Like that's actually the mark of a good leader. But 
I mean, if you think about his career, the reason he's a renegade is because probably he was told to like put it in an index fund or whatever, like yeah. whenever he made his like 29 million and from PayPal, I don't know how much he made and then just go along that run. He's like, no. So he, you know, succeeds spectacularly. So you have to have somebody who's willing to come in and buck that system. So for, for, for now, I think our politics are generally frozen. I think that that model is going to be most generally appealing to the mean person. But somebody will come along and will change everything. Yeah, I'm just surprised there's not way. more of them. Uh, yeah. On on that topic, yeah. uh, it's now 20, what is it, 21? Yes. 